So our next speaker is David Polson, um, and David's going to talk to us about achievability from land management. Okay. Well, I have come equipped with a pocket full of strepsils and a bottle of water. So I've had a cold, and I don't want to do a Theresa May. Um, right, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to come here. I should mention my uh, co-conspirators here with Paul Polk, Andy McDonald and Johnny Johnson. We've been doing an analysis of Rothamsted long-term sites to look at the rates of change of soil carbon. Uh, there's a paper in review at the moment and also Keith Goulding. Um, and it's certainly true, just as my little bit of background, that as humanity we face some huge challenges and climate change and food security are perhaps the biggest ones of them. And I've got three slides just to emphasise that. You may well have heard about this paper, but probably not so many people have read it. It was reported at the time of the, um, the COP meeting in Bonn. Um, it comes from the Global Land Project, and these people have um, worked out the emissions of CO2 from burning fossil fuels, and they did it for uh, an estimate for this year, to the end, estimate at the end of the year. And the bad news was that although it had been constant for a few years, it seems to have gone up this year, and reasons can be discussed separately, and it's reached about 10 gigatons of carbon. But of course there are other emissions, uh, for, uh, the CO2 from land clearance, plus uh, the trace gases, if you like, which make total anthropogenic emissions 13.4. Uh, Within not much more than 30 years, in the lifetimes of most of you, though maybe not me, um, there's going to be about 2 billion more people wanting food and other things that are derived from soil. And the evidence seems to be that it's not going to be too easy to do that for all sorts of reasons, but one of those is that um, th this paper drew out very well that for some major crops in some major areas, there have been yield plateaus. So this shows wheat in three European countries. Uh, overall yields have not increased in the last 20 years or so. Right, now this 4 per mill initiative um, has brought a whole spectrum of opinions. At one end of the spectrum, there's a very positive um, one. Uh, goodness sake, bring this man back, please, but that's, a, that's another matter. <laughs> At the other end of the spectrum, um, perhaps we could... Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember The Muppet Show, and these two old guys um, were always negative about virtually everything. Now, I would love to be at this end of the spectrum, but I fear not only because of my age, but because of the evidence that I'm, I've been pushed more towards that end, as that's what we're going to discuss. More organic matter is always better uh, for soil, and indeed there was this letter in the, in the Times only the other day. It improves virtually everything you can think about in soil. But it's difficult to increase, changes are slow, and the options for doing it are limited for all sorts of agronomic and economic reasons. The good news is that in terms of soil quality and functioning, even a small increase can have a big effect, and there's lots of literature that will show us that. So that's, that's good news. Um, you don't have to have tonnes and tonnes more carbon to improve soil functioning. Of course, the bad news is that the opposite is always also true. In terms of mitigating climate change through carbon sequestration, as has been said already, rather different um, considerations come in. You do need, it is the quantity of carbon that, that matters there. And of course, where we should, can do it, we jolly well should, there's no question about that. But we do need to be careful about the interpretation of a soil carbon increase that we see in an experiment. Is there really a net transfer of carbon that would have been in CO2 in the atmosphere to the land or an avoided emission? Or, sometimes is the case, carbon moved from one place in the land to the other. Um, we need to think about what land areas available for doing those things. And again, don't forget these other gases, nitrous oxide and methane, which are actually very dominant in many ways. And um, I was an author of a paper a few years ago where we re-examined the, the basis for um, considering carbon sequestration and often uh, things are overlooked and looked at in a rather superficial way, I think. Now, if we go to the, to the website of the 4 per mil initiative, um, uh, we read this. It says, if we increase by 4 per mil, 0.4% a year, the quantity of carbon contained in soils, um, we can halt the increase in CO2 in the atmosphere. Now, that's a big, well, that's a big statement. And uh, Claire explained how this was worked out earlier, so I don't really need to go through that. People took the emissions at the time, it's obviously gone up a gigaton now, um, and com compared that with the, the stock of carbon in the world, in all land, to a two metre depth and, and found out what it was and said if we could equal that, we would cancel out that. Now, there have been concerns expressed about that. Um, firstly, people say, for goodness sake, do we really suggest we can increase soil carbon to two metre depth? I think not. And later, uh, enunciations really have suggested they're looking at a 40 centimetre depth. 
But also, many soils are not under human management, so we cannot directly influence the carbon content or other things about them. It would appear that there are about 130 million square kilometres of land, um, I think it's ice-free land in the world, um, and about 38% of that is classified, according to the World Bank, as agriculture. Now, agriculture covers a multitude of sins, and agriculture, in this case, actually includes an awful lot of very low-intensity grazing pasture, rangelands, uh, where it's actually quite difficult to, uh, to do much to increase soil carbon. So of that 38% that's agriculture, it would seem that about a total of 12% of the world is in cropland, arable crops or, or, or other things other than if you like, rangeland, grassland. So that takes us down to a much smaller part of the world's soil that we can directly manage easily. And even if we increase that, let's say, to 20%, by bringing in some of the pasture, perhaps the lowland intensive pasture, and even some of the forest, we're still only looking at of the, the world's land area. So you've got to be careful what numbers we use. Now, many of you will be aware of this encyclopedic paper, and I have to take my hats off to, my hat off to the authors of this paper. They did an amazing job. They uh, talked about, the, they sort of promoted, in a way, the 4 per mil initiative. They got people, I think it's 20 different countries, to write sections about what could be done in their country. Now, it did provoke controversy, not so much controversy over the paper itself, I think, but over the 4 per mil initiative um, in more, wide, more widely. And there was a flurry of papers in Geoderma criticising letters to the editor about this. And you can see the, um, that that's the title of two of the papers. So you can get the idea of the sort of um, think points that were being made. And so, so some of the issues raised, I'm not going to go through them all, um, but one, one thing is that I can see the simplicity of saying four per mil, a sort of a, a fraction of what's there already, but it sort of implies if you've got a soil with a lot of carbon in it, then the potential, you've got a big potential to increase it more. Whereas most of us, I think, would think the opposite was sort of true. If we've got a soil that's got somewhat degraded, it's arable, it's got a low carbon content, then you've got more potential to increase it. That's not 100% true, but that, 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 that would seem to be more true to me. And so there are other issues there, uh, ignoring trace gases and so on. And of course, that also, again, we mustn't overlook the general limitations of soil carbon sequestration for this purpose. We should do it where we can. I'm not arguing against that in the slightest, but it's finite, it's potentially reversible, it does need nitrogen and phosphorus to accompany the carbon, um, and it could be lost uh, under climate change. I want to talk about what we've been doing with my colleagues just recently. We've been looking at all the long-term experiments under our control that we could find, they're on three sites with three or more actually different soil types. And out of that, we, 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 got not, we weren't only looking at very long-term periods, but some have gone on a long time. We got 114 treatment comparisons, and the treatments included manures and compost and straw and nitrogen fertiliser and different crop rotations, etc. Um, I'll pick out a few examples. We don't have now, anyway, any zero tillage experiments, unfortunately, um, because I think this is somewhere where we can do something. Uh, I, think, I think Claire said that, that not as much as is claimed by some enthusiasts, but it seems to me it's a, a sensible way to go anyway in many cases. Right, so here's one very extreme case. It's a long-term bar spring barley experiment that's had farmyard manure applied at a huge rate, 35 tonnes of fresh material per hectare every year. Totally mad, um, but that's, how, that's, that's what we inherited. Um, and soil carbon, my word, has gone up a lot. There's no question about that. Um, and we, we've expressed the, the rate in, in uh, parts per mil um, over a few 20-year periods. It's going up an enormous rate of knots. Um, so you can say, wow, that's great. Uh, a few little caveats here. First of all, if we are thinking of the four per mil based on a 40 centimetre soil layer, we're actually measuring more like 23 centimetres, a shallower layer. So in order to get equivalence, you've got to be looking for seven parts per mil in, in the layer we looked at. But the, more importantly, really, you would not be allowed to apply that much manure to soil. If you're in a nitrate vulnerable zone, the nitrogen limitations would stop you doing that. And anyway, as I think um, Bridget said, most farmers wouldn't have that much manure anyway. So it's, not, it's an experiment, it's a nice example for teaching, but it actually can't be done in many cases. And anyway, manure is usually moving carbon from one place to, the no to, to another. Here's another example. This is changing from a continuous arable cropping to a lay arable system. 
We've got an experiment on a sandy loam soil that Johnny Johnson and colleagues published about earlier this year. Um, so in the continuous arable situation, soil carbon was going down just a little bit, not much, but not significant, but tending downwards over a 35-year period. If we changed to three years pasture and two years arable, well, that was sort of stopped, it would seem. We started going the other direction. If we went to eight years pasture and two years arable, it was quite successful in terms of carbon. Um, we, we actually got some quite significant increases. But, of course... Um, we're actually only growing arable crops now in two years out of ten. So that does have a food production implication. Um, incorporating straw, cereal straw, of course, is something that we know would tend to increase soil carbon. We had a few examples of that over a fairly short period. We got fairly rapid rates of increase, uh, getting smaller over time because you're getting towards an equilibrium. Um, a few years ago, I was involved in a review of, I think it was what, 25 experiments from temperate regions where there was a straw and no straw comparison. And we found, yeah, as you'd expect, there was a general trend for soil carbon to increase with straw. But actually, it was only statistically significant in six out of the 25 experiments. So the effects were much smaller than you might have expected. However, in a sense, the good news, not for carbon sequestration, but for soil quality, if you like, that even in cases where you couldn't even really measure the increase in soil carbon, where people have measured things about the biology and the physics of the soil, they actually got better. So that's, that's, a, that's a good news thing there. Now, if you take land out of agriculture, you can certainly increase soil carbon. This is our Broadbalk Wilderness site, rather a grand word for a rather small area, but there we are. Don't blame me, I didn't think of the name, Gov. Um, and here we are. So this, this land in 1881 used to be arable field and it was fenced off, and this is sort of um, semi-natural uh, uh, woodland that, 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 that's naturally regenerated. And again, soil carbon has gone up, um, again, pretty fast. But of course, you're not growing any food there. So a few points to extract from our analysis of our long-term experiments. In fact, in about two-thirds of our treatment comparisons, we did indeed meet the four per mil goal, if you like. So that was good. But in order to do that, we'd either got to make some very we've got major changes in management. Now, there's huge, ridiculous applications of manure or taking land out of production, going to very really long rotations with a lot of grass in them. So there are severe limitations to achieving that rate in practice as opposed to in experiments. So some of the limitations can be summarised like this, a lack of resource, not enough manure. I mean, I think there are opportunities to use manure more efficiently from all sorts of points of view. We get more of that. Um, or the practice is already applied. And this is relevant to straw incorporation because in the UK there have been surveys that show that about 50% of cereal straw is returned directly to the soil. And most, by far most of the rest is used in animal bedding, which will become manure, and some of that will come back to the soil later. A little bit is burned in power stations, but very little. Or the practice that we would like to do is uneconomic. And this seems to be true in many cases for mixed farming, this lay arable system. Now, I think that's a good system, if only we could do it. And in fact, because agriculture is so dominated by um, regulations and policy, uh, subsidy systems, if we really wanted to go that, presumably we could force that by changing subsidies, either within the cap or, sadly, post-Brexit. So, you know, there are things that can be done, but huge limit different Im limitations. And, of course, if we test and remove land from agriculture, uh, this has an impact on global food security. Again, there are small, significant areas where it would be good to do that, um, but not over huge areas. Now, in the Menasny et al. paper, which, again, I, 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 is such an encyclopedic piece of work, they've got a huge table like that, where they've got, I think, 72 examples of experiments where soil carbon has been changed as a result of some um, treatment or other. So, and they found that, overall, there were a whole range of increases, sometimes none, sometimes very big, a mean of 12 parts per mil per year. So that looks sort of promising. Um, but, actually, of those, um, about a quarter were conversions of arable to grassland or forest. So, again, that's impact on, on food production. And so, globally, you can't really do that. And, and, and another large chunk were to do with organic additions, which are good for soil quality, but probably not um, for climate change mitigation. And then some others were to do with moving to these rotations. So, not quite as good as it might look 
immediately. And then here are some comments on, um, this, uh, on, the, on achieving um, th this goal by the country authors. So the paper was divided into different countries with different authors of different countries. So Ben Marchant wrote the bit for England and Wales, and it said to increase soil carbon stocks by this rate would require increases a bit over half a tonne of carbon per hectare per year. Now, I think that's a pretty um, tall order to get that on, on large areas. And the people that did it for Scotland made some comments about risks of loss of, um, of, of carbon from peat. But again, they said to achieve the four per mil there would require increase of 1.7 tonnes of carbon per hectare per year, which they said seems like a very ambitious target. Their words, not mine. Um, in responding to some of the critics, the, um, uh, uh, the Minasini people said, we believe that um, uh, the four per mil is a worthy aspirational target, fine. It's also become a slogan in helping the promotion of sustainable soil management. OK, there are some good slogans, but there are some blooming bad ones as well. So please don't give, don't give me slogans. I don't want slogans like that. Thank you very much. Oh, there's another one. Um, is there anybody from DEFRA here? I'm retired, you can't upset me. <laughs> so here, here's a quote from me. I, I see the value of slogans, of course I do, but I think that scientific advice to policymakers should be based on evidence-based reasonings, please, and not slogans. Right, so my personal uh, concluding comments, two slides on that. Um, of course, more organic matter is always good, and convincing policymakers that we need to, to do that for our soils is a positive thing to do, and it's true that we need simple messages to them in order to do that. Absolutely right. But we must recognise the limitations to achieving big rates of increase in soil carbon. And pretty bluntly, I think we've got to be truthful about what can be achieved and not exaggerate, not promise too much. And indeed, I think I go along with one of the et al, one of the, the papers in Geoderma, saying that it's a bit dangerous to pl promise too much climate change mitigation to policymakers because we risk losing credibility, because it will be found that we can't achieve what is at least implied strongly in the initiative, even though it's said it's aspirational, etc., etc. And it could even give the excuse not to reduce emissions. If people... Um, I hate to mention names of politicians, but if um, smart, uh, smarmy politicians can say, we can lock up carbon in the soil so we don't have to worry about decreasing emissions so much, that would worry me greatly. And I would strongly suggest that in this sort of initiative, it would be much better if we emphasise the benefits of soil carbon for sustainable global food security and ecosystem functions with if you like, the climate change part is a, a welcome extra. I would put it that way around. And don't forget the other greenhouse gases from land management, the nitrous oxide and, and methane. There are a lot of work going on, of course, to improve um, nitrogen management, decrease N2O, and also with animal feed and type things for, for, for methane. And in fact, these might be actually easier to address than trying to get big rates of change of soil carbon. And we should certainly be giving greater emphasis to avoiding land clearance. And that's, in a way, my um, real concern about the 4 per mil initiative. The focus seems to be on increasing carbon in arable soils, which we should, of course we should. But I'd like to hear just as much about avoiding carbon emissions from this sort of thing. Even where we've got, we're um, growing more oil palms, sometimes to make biofuel to save the planet. Mad. Anyway, um, OK, so I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention. Um, just to draw your attention, I'm advertising now. That's the 175th wheat crop on the Broadbork experiment that's now in the ground. And next year, there'll be a conference on long-term experiments that you're all welcome to. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, David. Um, any quick points for clarification? Very quick questions, yes. Thanks very much. That's very interesting. Um, Louisa Peake uh, from UEA and Reading Agricultural Consultants. You, you said there's not much we can do with rangeland in right, general. Okay. Um, while I'm not an advocate of particularly of so-called holistic management and rotational yep. grazing yep. Yep. as a solution to climate change, they have shown great benefits as possibly the best form of pastoral yep. Yep. system yep. we could have. And, yep. and uh, that's a fair point. I mean, the, the, if you like, the extreme version of that, I think, has been strongly criticised and debunked. But, yeah, it does seem that there are things you can do with... with, with, yeah, with 
it's short-term intensive grazing of grassland. You can do something with some of the grassland, absolutely right. 